Sugar is the ultimate antioxidant. It's a big claim, right? Before people get their panties in a bunch, let me explain something to you. When I say sugar, I'm referring to glucose and fructose. I'm not referring to or advocating donuts, cakes, and all manner of foodstuffs people commonly associate with the word sugar. People rarely ever consume sugar in its pure form. When was the last time you ate a spoonful of raw coconut or maple sugar, real honey or royal jelly? For many of you, probably never. Everyone loves to demonize sugar as the cause of obesity, yet when you analyze both the research and the actual biochemistry of the human body, you start to see a very different picture unfold, with some extremely convincing evidence to the contrary. In today's video, I'm going to explore the science of sugar. This is an appropriate topic, especially since we've been digging into the thermo diet and looking deeply at the flaws in the keto diet, and therefore the differences between a glucose metabolism and a fatty acid metabolism. And so far, we've seen how preferable and efficient glucose metabolism is for hormonal health and a healthy metabolism. A lot of the propaganda around the keto diet involves the demonization of sugar and a glucose metabolism. Even though this is biochemically unsound, and a fatty acid keto metabolism have, has far more negative consequences on the human body due to the stressful hormonal shift required for it. Now it's time to bust some myths about sugar that you might still be clinging to, thanks to the hearsay and mass media's propaganda and relentless demonization of sugar. Let's begin. So first off, sugar does not equal baked goods. It does not equal candy bars, soft drinks, and anything else people commonly associate it with. It's not the same thing. All these foodstuffs are nothing more than nutrient void garbage food that should be consumed sparingly, if at all. This is the real crime in implicating sugar as something that's bad for the body because the baby gets thrown out with the bathwater. People, by association, demonize fruit, honey, royal jelly, and even just simple raw cane sugar with zero real evidence for its negative effects in the context of an otherwise solid, hormonally focused diet like we talk about on this channel and in my books. Rarely do people fully understand what sugar is and how it acts in the body and how much it really contributes to obesity, inflammation, hormones, etc. And now that we've moved over from blaming saturated fat for all of our health problems, we need a new thing to demonize and blame for our obesity and health problems. Sugar is the perfect target, and it certainly gets its share of a bad rap already. But did you know that even though we try to blame sugar for everything and say that we are getting fatter and fatter due to increased sugar usage, the science actually shows that sugar consumption has dropped during this period of time that the obesity rates have dramatically risen. One study calls this the Australian paradox, as during the time frame of 1980 to 2003, obesity rates tripled in the country yet the intake of refined sugar dropped by 23%. Heck, I certainly have given my fair share of negative press on sugar in the past years uh, before I really looked at the data because I was, you know, I was listening to other people that I shouldn't have been listening to. But over the years, as my knowledge, and my understanding of scientific literature has vastly improved, I've come to realize that my initial thoughts about sugar being unhealthy were for the most part inaccurate assumptions based largely on the popular opinion and validation of my own beliefs of the time. I'm thankful for the fact that I can admit my failures and open myself up to new evidence to form an opinion. But with that being said, I don't have much at stake for this sugar thing. Think about the people who have written best-selling books in low-carb diets, paleo, and the evil, evils of sugar. And will they be able to actually admit to their readers that what they believe was right? Uh, might actually have been inaccurate in a manifestation of their own beliefs at the time. Now, most people will never admit this at this point because they have way too much to lose for building a career off of inaccurate assumptions. And this is likely one of the reasons it took so long for the saturated fat and dietary cholesterol myths to actually subside. Now, let's not get sidetracked, however. Back to sugar, health, and hormones. So first off, what is sugar? Sugars are naturally occurring carbohydrates that provide energy for the body in the form of glucose and fructose. Your brain, for example, requires roughly 130 grams of glucose on a daily basis to cover the most basic energy needs. The major internal organs, glands, and muscles all use glucose as their main energy source. If you deprive your body from this, it will try to make up for it by a process called gluconeogenesis, which in the body... Uh, it breaks down protein and fatty acids to create glucose. If you do this long enough and your body goes into ketosis, which surely has some benefits in, in, in terms of fasting, uh, it's also just another form of metabolic stress that uh, is designed to occur during the glucose deprivation. 
Almost all carbohydrates, starches, and sugars break down to glucose, the simplest form of sugar after ingestion. The rate at which this happens is measured by the glycemic index or the glycemic load. Although low carbers tried for years to confuse average people into believing that low glycemic index would be it for weight loss, research showed time and again that it was the total energy intake of calories, not the glycemic index, that is behind our ability to gain or lose body fat. Now, the most common kinds of sugar in our diet include glucose, which is the simplest form of sugar in the main energy provider in the cells in the body. The blood sugar in your veins is also glucose. Uh, There's fructose, which is found naturally in fruits and honey. It's much sweeter than glucose and is metabolized in the liver instead of in the gut. Now, there's sucrose, which is table sugar. It's about 50% fructose and 50% glucose. You can get it extracted from beets or sugarcane. Sucrose occurs naturally in vegetables and fruits. And then there's lactose, which is milk sugar. It's found in milk and dairy products, naturally. Uh, there's also, also maltose, which is found in malted drinks and beer. Now, the studies looking into the effects of sugar on various health parameters often use pure fructose, pure glucose, or sucrose. In our normal daily lives, the majority of the sugars we consume come in a balance of about 50% glucose and 50% fructose. The main difference between glucose and fructose is the fact that the latter is metabolized in the liver and is more rapidly absorbed. So there are some actually uh, some real health benefits of sugar. Due to the demonization of sugar, it might seem a bit crazy to claim that sugar consumption would actually have health benefits. It does definitely seem that way. However, there is evidence to the contrary. So why would this source of energy that the body naturally prioritizes be harmful for us? Why would the most easily attainable naturally occurring foods like berries or fruit, which are loaded with simple sugars, be the cause of our ever increasing weight and health problems? And lastly, why would these problems have skyrocketed all while our consumption of sugar has actually decreased? I certainly don't have the answers to all these questions, but if we look at the scientific evidence without any pre-existing beliefs about sugar, it becomes obvious that this stuff is not as bad as one would think. There's plenty of research showing how glucose and fructose actually negatively correlate with diabetes, and that fructose, due to the fact that it's metabolized in the liver, doesn't need insulin to be pushed into the cells, which is probably why higher intakes of fructose have been found to improve, yes, improve insulin sensitivity. Bears coming out of hibernation actually fully reverse their full-blown diabetic state by eating honey, which is a rich source of fructose. Oh, and then what about the claimed idea that sugar makes us fat? That's what everyone says. Has anyone considered the fact that sugars are actually the primary fuel for the thyroid gland? Your thyroid gland requires glucose. And that the thyroid gland actually controls the rate at which your body burns calories, aka your metabolic rate. When you eat more simple sugars, your thyroid gland produces more T4 thyroid hormones. And with the adequate sugar stored in the liver, your body can easily convert T4 into the active T3 form, which greatly improves energy production and metabolic rate. If sugars and carbohydrates make us fat, why in the world are almost all bodybuilders for the last 100 years, why have they all eaten high-carb diets while getting chiseled? Heck, when you lower your calories in order to lose weight, one of the most powerful compounds that can preserve metabolic rate is in fact fructose. It supposedly is the substance most notorious for making us gain weight. However, in reality, it's pretty low in caloric content, has the ability to greatly support metabolic rate, and has a muscle-sparing effect. The liver provides about 70% of our active thyroid hormone by converting thyroxin to T3, but it can provide this active hormone only when it has adequate glucose. So what about the fatty liver disease, the one of the key evils that fructose is blamed for? Well, in reality, fructose has been shown to be protective against hepatic liver issues. And when there's adequate choline in the diet, overfeeding of fructose does not lead to fat accumulation in the liver at all. The problem of fatty liver disease has nothing to do with fructose and everything to do with eating too much polyunsaturated fatty acids, which which actually prevent exportation of liver fat and the lack of choline, which is a necessary micronutrient required in the exportation of fat from the liver as well. Lastly, you may have heard a stupendous amount of authors and mommy bloggers going around in circles saying that sugar would be toxic and that it would increase oxidative damage and inflammation in the body. However, research shows that simple sugars actually have the antioxidative effects, improving the antioxidant capacity of cells and therefore reducing inflammation and oxidative stress, 
And about that claim that sugar is toxic, seriously, how many times have you heard someone actually getting poisoned by sugar? How often are kids rushed to the ER and it's sh with sugar poisoning after Halloween, for example? It's just a ridiculous claim. Sugar is the primary source of energy that our cells crave. It's widespread in the most natural foodstuffs and simple sugars are the main fuel for the master gland that controls our metabolic rate and energy production, the thyroid. Glucose and fructose have antioxidant-like effects. In reality, they don't contribute to fatty liver disease at all unless there's a deficiency of choline which prevents the exportation of fat from the liver. So really, what are we afraid of here? So let's go back to the very first thing that I said in this video. Sugar is the ultimate antioxidant. What does that even mean? Uh, well, glucose actually plays a vital, vitally important role in the production of glutathione. So we actually have a complex endogenous antioxidant system that is ultimately fueled by glucose. Through the pentose phosphate pathway, glucose supplies hydrogen ions and electrons, which we would call reducing power to NADPH, which is derived from niacin, which is also known as vitamin B3. The enzyme glutathione reductase uses riboflavin, also known as vitamin B2, to pass this reducing power onto glutathione. Glutathione, the master endogenous antioxidant, then uses this reducing power to neutralize hydrogen peroxide to water to neutralize lipid peroxidases to less harmful hydroxy fatty acids and to recycle vitamin C. Vitamin C recycles vitamin E, the principal defense against lipid peroxidation in cellular membranes. Thus, the multiple roles of glutathione within the antioxidant defense system, mitigating the accumulation of reactive oxygen species, protecting vulnerable fatty acids within the cellular membranes, in cleaning up any damage that has slipped through the system and are ultimately ultimately supported by reducing power derived from the glucose. I also want to highlight one last very important point. I'm by no means advocating an excess consumption of anything. In fact, I've always advocated the opposite in trying to seek a balanced macronutrient consumption across the board, since that's truly what the full breadth of research on human metabolism and hormonal health actually suggests. Many people will advocate that you stop eating or drastically in, uh, increase or reduce the entire macronutrient group, you know, like certain things like uh, never eat carbs or never eat fat and that sort of stuff that everyone says. If you run into this type of poorly researched advice, I would advise you to run the opposite direction or seriously question who is giving you this advice. An excess of anything by definition is imbalanced and typically leads down a dead end road. When you run into a dead end, you will always need to put the car in reverse and come back to where you started. So instead of wasting more time, it'd be in all of our best interests to start approaching nutrition with more balance, especially since the basic foundations of human biochemistry and the full context of research on hormones supports this notion. With healthy hormones and a fast metabolism, all of people's typical fat loss, muscle building, and sexual health goals can be achieved.